Welcome to another edition of One on One. Today we're very pleased uh, to have as our guest Michael J. Madigan, who is Speaker of the Illinois House of Representatives. Welcome, Speaker Madigan. Thank you. Uh, Mike Madigan has been Speaker of the Illinois House for 19 of the last 21 years. His legislative district generally is on the southwest side uh, near Midway Airport. Uh, Mr. Madigan also served as a delegate to the Constitutional Convention uh, before he was 30 years old. Uh, he's a Democrat ward committeeman uh, and presides over one of the most effective uh, political organizations in the state in that role and he is the Democratic State Chairman as well. Let's begin, Mr. Speaker, uh, with your role as Speaker. How do you perceive that role? I perceive my role as Speaker on a uh, two-pronged track. So, number one, uh, I become the Speaker because I'm the Democratic candidate for the office of Speaker. Therefore, I feel that I should act as a political party activists in terms of what I do in the legislature. At the same time, there's a, very, uh, there's a very real expectation among the members of the legislature and the public that the uh, person who occupies the office of speaker should perform in a bipartisan manner, that that, that, that person ought to administer that office so that the administration of the office is fair to all the members of the House of Representatives, which I firmly believe in. And I think that over the last few years, over the last several years, we've done a very good job in terms of providing bipartisanship, providing equal treatment, equal rights to all members of the House. Now, in the introduction, I said you've been Speaker 19 out of the last 21 right. years. There was that two-year hiatus when uh, the Republicans uh, basically were the majority in the House as a result of uh, pretty much of a landslide in 1994 election or a sweep, let's right. say, in 1994. Were you a different speaker after uh, that hiatus uh, than you were before? Yes. Uh, those two years, as I say, those two years in the wilderness were very helpful because it gave me an opportunity to reflect on how I con conducted the office of speaker from 1983 to 94, to realize that I had made uh, mistakes, uh, some of those mistakes in administration, some of those mistakes in treatment of other people, especially members of the Republican Party. And so having had two years to, uh, to uh, reflect, uh, two years to uh, repent, coming back in uh, 1997, I decided, as I do today, that the administration of the House should be on a fair, equal, bipartisan basis. And I think that you'll find a clear majority of Republicans in the House today that would tell you that, uh, yes, uh, Speaker Madigan does a very fair job of administering the House of Representatives. Now, you came into the uh, House in 1971. Uh, what changes have there been in the legislature since 1971? Over the last uh, 30 to 34 years, well, I think the legislature has become more professionalized. I think you have a, a more members of the legislature that are full-time, very committed, very dedicated to the work that they do in the legislature. The, the, the end result of all of that is that today, Illinoisans get a more thoughtful work product coming out of the legislature than they did 30 years ago. That's not to say that what we do in the legislature is perfect or close to perfect, but I think that everybody should understand that uh, the clear majority of the members of the legislature today are thoughtful people, very committed to doing uh, a good job and uh, responding appropriately to the people that sent them to the legislature. Now, there have been external changes which have had an impact on the legislature. I, I, I don't know whether you'll agree with me or not, but the, uh, I don't think the uh, Democrats from the city of Chicago, are, are uh, they have their own way of looking at things oftentimes where previously uh, Mayor Richard J. Daley uh, pretty much gave the marching orders. 
Uh, you also have had, because of court decisions, governors don't have as much flexibility and patronage uh, to either uh, offer to legislators to support them or to punish them with. Uh, many believe that vacuum in power has been filled by the legislative leaders, the, the four legislative leaders of the respective caucuses. Uh, do you think those leaders have too much power today? <laughs> <laughs> Not today, but maybe sometime in the future. Uh, they would have uh, too much power. Um, I, I, let me uh, respond in this way. Uh, the conditions that existed in 1971 that you described are conditions where forces external to the legislature are exerting influence upon the legislature. So in the 70s, it would have been the office of the governor, the office of mayor of Chicago, exerting influence upon the legislature. Over the years, that has diminished. There are still forces external to the legislature that uh, bring influence to bear upon the legislature. Any special interest group, the Illinois Medical Society, the Illinois Hospital Association, the Illinois Trial Lawyers Association, the Illinois Board of Realtors, those are all associations or forces external to the legislature that exert an influence over the legislature. In the middle of all of that are the members of the legislature and those that are the leaders of the legislature. Uh, like any situation, the person that finds themselves as a leader in the legislature is pretty much in a position to uh, shape exactly how they wish to perform their, their job. Uh, they can be strong or they can be weak, active or passive. In my case, I decided years ago that I wanted to be a strong legislative leader, an active legislative leader. There have been others in the history of the legislature that took a different view. So it could happen today that uh, there would be a leader in the legislature who would not be viewed as unduly powerful because that person's personality, that person's view of their role in the legislature would be different than me. Um, I would hope that acting from a position of strength, that I do good things, not bad things, I would hope. And I'm open to direction, I'm open to criticism. I get my share of criticism from the media, and so I do read that, and that will shape how I do things in the legislature. Well, there, some people have the view, I, I don't, I'm gonna say right here, I don't agree with this, but some people have the view that you're out there, you're really a, an arm twister, that you're really bludgeoning your members into going along, and sometimes uh, you do have the task of putting Democrat votes up on the voting board on issues that may be the right public policy but are tough politically. So how do you, how do you get those members up right. there as uh, green lights on those kind of issues? Uh, for those people who think that there's too much arm twisting in the legislature by the leaders, uh, those people ought to come to Springfield. They ought to come to the Capitol building. They ought to spend some time at the Capitol building interact with members of the legislature, observe how business is done in the legislature. And most of them, the, you know, the strong majority of them would come to the view, well, uh, if there is arm twisting, it's not uh, undue. It's just persuasion, it's conversation. And you take me into another area, which is you know, very accurate. Uh, I am selected as the leader of the Democrats in the House of Representatives before I become elected as the speaker. I do have an obligation to be a political party leader, which means that where there is a issue position or a piece of legislation that does relate to political party position, it's expected that I will be an active uh, an active uh, supporter of those positions, working closely with the people in the House to move that position or that issue through the legislature. Does that mean that I get into undue arm twisting, threats, intimidation? That doesn't happen. And for someone who doesn't agree with me, again, I invite them to come to the Capitol building spend time with the Democratic members of the House, the people that I interact with day in and day out, and they will be told, Speaker Madigan does not threaten people. He does not intimidate people. He will come out on the floor. He will go into a Democratic caucus. He will attempt 
to articulate a democratic position on certain issues, but there's never threats, there's never intimidation. It just doesn't happen. Would it be fair to say that you have a very good idea of the kind of districts the individual members come from and what kind of issues politically they can vote for and still survive and, and what kind of issues they can't support and, uh, without getting into trouble? Is that part of the, the leadership? Uh, yes, in two respects. Yes, I know the composition and the makeup of their districts. In addition, I spend time with my members. I'm not squirreled away in an office. I'm on the floor of the House interacting with my members, asking them, how do you feel about this issue, being there so they can volunteer to me how they feel about certain issues. So in terms of my interaction with my members, it's not so much that I'm issuing orders and directives. It's a case where I'm there, we're talking, we're colleagues together. They're sharing with me the uh, problems that they have in their districts, the concerns they have relative to their districts, the concerns that they have about statewide legislation. So putting that all together, a knowledge of their district, a knowledge of their statements to me, I pretty much know how they'll vote on a particular issue. I'll pretty much know whether they can be persuaded to vote for or against an issue. Uh, let me take a case in point. Uh, the legislature today is, is considering legislation that would provide that people who are in the United States illegally can get an Illinois driver's license. Uh, the bill was called a few weeks ago. I voted yes for the bill. The bill failed. Later, I was the sponsor of a bill that would provide that people who are in the country legally people who have been approved for entry into the United States by the U.S. Naturalization, Immigration and Naturalization Service can get a driver's license. Well, upon the passage of my bill, which said if you're legal, you can have a driver's license, the proponents of the bill that said illegals should get a driver's license descended upon me and said, well, if you can pass your bill, why can't we pass our bill? And I tried to explain to them that I don't feel they understand the depth of opposition to illegals having driver's licenses. I don't think they appreciate how the citizens of the state react negatively to that proposal. But that's, that's a uh, persuasion process, a discussion process. I had that discussion. I didn't do real well in bringing them to my understanding of it. When we go back into session, I'll talk with them again. And I'll point out to them some information that I picked up subsequent to that conversation where I had dinner with two of my members who voted for the bill for the illegals. And both of these members told me that, yes, they voted for the bill as an accommodation to the sponsors of the bill, but they got an earful from their spouses when they called home that night where their spouses were telling them that's a bad vote that you cast. So to me, you know, that, that's information that ought to be passed on to the proponents of the bill that want illegals to have a license. What you want to do is to work with them in a friendly, you know, in a non-confrontational manner to um, you know, help them understand you know, the depth of an issue outside of the Capitol building. Unfortunately, the people go to the legislature, they're in the Capitol building, they get most of their information from those special interests external to the legislature, 